This proud boast so aroused the indignation of the Lord that in order to humble it, he spoke to Lucifer. This woman who thou refusest to honor shall crush thy head, and by her shalt thou be vanquished and annihilated. Genesis 3.15 And if through thy pride death enters into the world, wisdom 2.24, life and salvation of mortals shall enter through the humility of this woman. Those that are of the nature and likeness of that man and woman shall enjoy the gifts and the crowns which thou and thy followers have lost. To all this, the dragon, filled with indignation against whatever he understood of the divine will and decrees, answered only with pride and by threatening destruction to the whole human race. The good angel saw the just indignation of the Most High against Lucifer and his apostates, and they combated them with the arms of the understanding, reason, and truth. The Almighty, at this conjuncture, worked another wonderful mystery, having given to all the angels a sufficiently clear intelligence of the great mystery of the hypostatic union. He showed them the image of the Most Holy Virgin by means of an imaginary vision. I speak here according to our way of understanding such things. They were shown the perfection of the human nature in the revelation of an image representing a most perfect woman. in whom the Almighty Arm of the Most High would work more wonderfully than in all the rest of the creatures. For therein he was to deposit the graces and gifts of his right hand in a higher and more eminent manner. This sign or vision of the Queen of Heaven and the Mother of the Incarnate Word was made known and manifest to all the angels, good and bad. The good ones at the sign of it broke forth in admiration and in canticles of praise, and from that time on began to defend the honor of of the God incarnate and of his Holy Mother, being armed with ardent zeal and with the invincible shield of that vision. The dragon and his allies, on the contrary, conceived implacable hatred and fury against Christ and his most Holy Mother. They happened, then happened all that which is described in the twelfth chapter of the Apocalypse, which will, I will explain as far as it has been given me in the following chapter which follows up the previous discourse by the explanations of the twelfth chapter of the Apocalypse. The literal version of the ch that chapter of the Apocalypse is as follows. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried, prevailing in birth, and was in pain to be delivered. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, who was ready to be delivered, that when she should be delivered he might devour her son. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with an iron rod, and her son was taken up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, that there they should feed her a thousand two hundred and sixty days. And there was a great battle in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. And they prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the dragon was cast out, that old serpent who is called the devil and Satan, who seduceth the whole world, and he was cast unto the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice saying, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ, because the accuser of our brethren is cast forth, who accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of his testimony, of the testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you that dwell therein, Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down unto you, having a great wrath, and knowing that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child. And there were given to the woman two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the desert unto her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times and a half a time, for the, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth after the woman water as if it were a river, that he might cause her to be carried away by the river. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed the river, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. 
And the dragon was angry against the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he stood upon the sands of the sea. Such are the words of the evangelist. He speaks in the past because at that time was shown him a vision of that which had already happened. He says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. This sign appeared really in the heavens by divine disposition and was shown to the good and the bad angels, in order that seeing it they might subject their will to the pleasure and the commands of God. They saw it, therefore, before the good ones choose the good and before the bad ones had turned evil. It was, as it were, a mirror of the wonderful perfection of the handiwork of God in creating human nature. Although he had already revealed this perfection to the angels in making known to them the mystery of the hypostatic union, yet he wished to reveal it to them also in a different manner by showing it to them in a mere creature, the most perfect and holy, the most perfect and holy, which next to the humanity of our Lord he was to create. It was also a sign for the assurance of the good angels and for confusion of the bad, since it manifested to them that in spite of the offense which was committed, God would not let the decree of creating man be unfulfilled, and that the incarnate word and this woman his mother would please him infinitely more than the disobedient angels could ever displease him. The sign was also like the rainbow which appeared after the flood in the clouds of heaven, as a guarantee that even if men should sin like the angels and become disobedient, they were not to be punished like the angels without remission, but would be furnished with salutary medicine in remedy by this wonderful sign. It was as if God said to the angels, I will not chastise in the same way the other creatures which I call into my existence, because this woman, in whom my only begotten is to assume flesh, belongs to that race. My son shall be the restorer of friendship and the pacifier of my justice. He shall open the way to felicity which sin would close. Excuse me. In further testimony of this, after the punishment of the disobedient angels, God made use of the sign in order to show that his anger, which the pride of Lucifer had occasioned, was appeased and placated. And according to our way of understanding, he rejoiced in the presence of the queen thus represented in that image. He gave the angels to understand that, through Christ and his mother, he would now divert upon men the grace which the apostates had lost through their rebellion. There was also another effect of that great sign among the good angels, namely that since they had been, as it were, made sorrowful and made unhappy, speaking according to our way of understanding, the Most High now wished to rejoice them with the sight of that image and to increase their essential beatitude by this accidental pleasure merited by the victory over Lucifer. Seeing this woman so full of clemency, Esther 4.11, appearing to them as a sign of peace, they understood at once that the decree of punishment was not issued against them since they had obeyed the precepts of the Lord and His divine will. Much of the mysteries and sacraments of the Incarnation and those of the Church Militant and its members were made manifest to them in this sign. They understood also that they were to assist and help the human race by watching over men, by defending them against their enemies, and by leading them to eternal felicity. They saw that they themselves would owe their felicity to the merits of the Incarnate Word and that the Creator had preserved them also in grace through Christ preordained in the divine mind. Just as, in, just as all this was a great joy and happiness for the good angels, so it was a great torment for the evil spirits. It was to the latter a part and the beginning of their punishment, for they saw at once that having failed to profit by this sign, they were to be conquered and crushed by it. All these mysteries and many others which I cannot explain, the evangelists wish to comprehend in this chapter and include in that great sign, although for us it would remain obscure and enigmatic until the proper time arrives. The sun which is mentioned as clothing the woman is the true sun of justice. The angels were to understand by it that the Most High was to remain with this woman by his grace in order to overshadow and defend her by the protection of his invincible right hand. The moon was beneath her feet. For, as the two planets, the sun and the moon, divide night and day, therefore the moon, being the symbol of the darkness of sin, is beneath her feet, 
and the sun being the symbol of the light of grace clothes her for all eternity. Thus also the deficiencies of grace and all mortals must be beneath her feet and never must rise either to her soul or to her body, which on the contrary were to be ever superior to all angels and men. She alone was to be free from the darkness and the warnings of Lucifer and of Adam, treading them underfoot without their being able to gain any advantage over her. And just as she rose above all the guilt and the effects of original and actual sin, God now placed these in a symbolical manner under her feet, in order that the good angels might know, and the bad ones, though they did not attain full knowledge of the mysteries, might fear this woman even before she came into actual existence. The crown of twelve stars are evidently all the virtues with which the Queen of Heaven and Earth was to be adorned, but the mystery of this but the mystery of its being composed of twelve stars has reference to the twelve tribes of Israel, by which all the elect and the predestined are designated, as is mentioned in the seventh chapter of the Apocalypse by the Evangelist, Apocalypse 7, 4. And since the gifts, graces, and virtues of all the elect were to crown their queen in a most eminent and exalted degree, a crown of twelve stars was placed around her head. And being with child in the presence of all the angels, for the rejoicing of the good and for the punishment of the evil ones who resisted the divine will and the fulfillment of these mysteries, it became manifest that the three persons of the blessed trinity had selected this wonderful woman as the mother of the only begotten of the Father. And since the dignity of the mother of the word was the principal beginning and foundation of all the great excellences of this great mistress and of this her symbol, she was shown to the angels as being the resting place of the holy trinity represented in the divine personality of the Word incarnate. For on account of their inseparable union and coexistence, all the three persons could not fail to be there, wherever any one of them was present, although only the person of the Word assumed human flesh, and with him alone she was pregnant. She cried, travailing in birth. Although the dignity of this queen and of that mystery was to be hidden in the beginning in order that God might be born humble, poor, and unknown, yet afterwards the news of that birth was proclaimed so loudly that its first echo excited King Herod and filled him with uneasiness. It drew the Magi from their palaces and kingdoms in order to find him. Matthew 2, 3. Some hearts were touched with fear, others moved to interior affection. The fruit of this birth, growing until it was raised on the cross, gave such loud voices that it was heard from the rising to the setting sun. John 12, 32, and from farthest north to farthest south, Romans 10, 18. So far then was heard the voice of that woman who gave birth to the word of the Eternal Father. And this was in pain to be, and, and was in pain to be delivered. He does not say this because she was to give birth in bodily pain, for that is not possible in this divine paturation, but because it was to be a great sorrow for that mother to see that divine infant come forth from the secrecy of her virginal womb in order to suffer and die as a victim for the satisfaction of the sins of the world. For this queen could know and did know all of this beforehand by her knowledge of the Holy Scriptures. On account of the natural love of such a mother for such a son, she must be deeply afflicted thereby, although in subjection to the will of God. In this pain was also foreshadowed the sorrow of this most gentle mother at the thought of being deprived of the presence of her treasure after he should have issued from her virginal womb. For although her soul always enjoyed his presence as to his divinity, yet she was to be a long time without his bodily presence, according to which he was exclusively her son. The Most High had determined to exempt her from guilt, but not from the labors and sorrows corresponding to the reward which was prepared for her. Thus the sorrows of this birth were not the effect of her of sin, as they are in the descendants of Eve, but they were the effect of the intense and perfect love of the Most Holy Mother for her, her Divine Son. All these mysteries were motives of praise and admiration for the good angels and the beginning of punishment for the bad angels. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head were seven diadems, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Thereupon followed the punishment of Lucifer and his allies, for after uttering his blasphemies against the woman who had been symbolized in the heavenly sign, 
he found himself visibly and exteriorly transformed from a most beautiful angel to a fierce and most horrid dragon. He reared with fury his seven heads, that is, he led on the seven legions or squadrons of all those that followed and fell with him. To each principality or congregation of these followers he gave a head, commanding them to sin on their own account and undertake the leadership of the seven mortal sins, which are commonly called capital. For in these are contained the other sins, and they constitute, as it were, the raiments that rise up against God. They are the sins called pride, envy, avarice, anger, luxury, intemperance, and sloth. They are the seven diadems which Lucifer, after being changed into a dragon, was crowned. This is the punishment with which he was visited by the Most High and which he acquired as a return for his horrible wickedness for himself and for his confederate angels. To all of them were apportioned the punishment and the pains which correspond to their malice and to the share with which they had in originating the seven capital sins. The ten horns were the triumphs of the iniquity and malice of the dragon, and the vain and arrogant glorification and exultation which he attributed to himself in the execution of his wickedness. In his depraved desire of attaining the object of his arrogance, he offered to the unhappy angels his malicious and poisonous friendship and his counterfeit principalities, commanderships, and rewards. These promises, full of bestial ignorance and error, were the tail with which the dragon drew after him the third part of the stars of heaven. These angels were the stars, and if they would have per persevered, they would have shone with the rest of the angels, and the just, just like the sun, through the perpetual eternities. Daniel 12.3 But the punishment which they merited drew them down to the earth of their unhappiness, into this very center, which is hell, where they will for all eternity be deprived of light and happiness. Jude 6 And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered, that when she should be delivered he might devour her son. The pride of Lucifer was so boundless that he pretended to place his throne on high, and with the utmost boasting he spoke in the presence of the woman symbolized in the heavenly sign. This son of which that woman is to bring forth is of lower nature than mine. I shall devour him and destroy him. I shall lead on my followers against him. I shall spread my doctrines against his decrees and against the laws which he set up. I shall wage perpetual war and contradiction against him. But the answer of the Most High Lord was that this woman was to bring forth a man-child who was to reign over the nations with an iron rod. This man, the Lord added, shall be not only the son of that woman, but he shall also be my son, true God and true man, gifted with power to overcome thy pride and crush thy head. He will be to thee and to all those who hear and follow thee a powerful judge who shall rule thee with a rod of iron and bring to naught all thy vain and aspiring thoughts. This son shall be taken up to the, my throne where he shall be seated at my right hand as judge and I will place his enemies for a footstool beneath his feet in order to triumph over them. Psalms 2.9 He will be rewarded as the just man who being at the same time true God has done so much for his creatures. All shall know him and give him reverence and honor. Psalms 109.1 But thou, as the most unhappy, shall know what is the day of the wrath of the all-powerful. This woman, too, shall be placed in solitude, where she will have a place assigned by me. This solitude to which the woman fled is the position which our great queen holds as being only and alone, unsurpassed in sanctity and exempt from all sin, for she, being of the same nature as mortals, far excelled all the angels in grace, merits, and gifts attained in common with them. Thus she, who was the only one, and without a compeer among creatures, fled and was placed in a solitude exalted above all the rest. This solitude was so far removed from all sin that the dragon could not even attain sight of it, nor could he be from that from the time of her conception discern anything of her, nor could he from the time of her conception discern anything of her. The Most High placed her alone and as the only one in the world who never had intercourse with and never was in subordination to the serpent. On the contrary, with solemn promise and assurance, he affirmed and decreed, This woman from the first instant of her existence shall be my only one, chosen for myself, I exempt her even now from the jurisdiction of her enemies, and I will assign to her a position of grace most eminent and incomparable 
in order that there she may be nourished 1,260 days. Apos? Uh, I don't know what that stands for. One of the books of the Bible. Apocalypse, maybe? 12-6. That number of days the queen was to remain in an interior and spiritual state of the most exalted and extraordinary graces, which were to be more memorable and wonderful. This happened in the last years of her life, as, with the help of God, I will relate in its place. In that state, she was nourished in such a divine manner that our understanding will never be able to grasp it. And because these graces were in a certain measure the end toward which others of the life of the Queen of Heaven were ordained, and, as it were, their culmination, the evangelist makes a special mention of them. The rest of the twelfth chapter of the Apocalypse is explained. And there was a great battle in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. When the Lord had manifested these things to the good and to the bad angels, the holy prince Michael and his companions, with the permission of God, gave battle to the dragon and his followers. It was a wonderful battle, for it was fought with the understanding and the will. St. Michael, burning with zeal for the honor of God, and armed with divine power and with his own humility, resisted the arrogant pride of the dragon, saying, Worthy is the highest of honor, praise, and reverence, and of being loved, feared, and obeyed by all creation. He is mighty to work whatever he desires. He that is increate and without dependence on any other being cannot seek anything that is not just, not most just. To us he gave grace such as we have, creating us and forming us out of nothing. He can create other beings as may and in what manner he pleases. It is reasonable that we, submissive and prostrate in his presence, adore his majesty and kingly grandeur. Come then, ye angels, follow me. Let us adore him and extol his admirable and secret judgments, his most perfect and holy works. God is most exalted and above all creatures, and he would not be the most high if he if we could attain to comprehend his great works infinite he infinite he is in wisdom and goodness rich in the treasures of his benefits as the lord of all and needing none he can distribute them to whomsoever he wishes and he cannot err in this in the selection he can love and confer his favor on whomsoever he chooses and he can love whom he likes he can rise up raise up create and enrich according as it is his good pleasure in all things he will be wise, holy, and irresistible. Let us adore and thank him for the wonderful work of the Incarnation which he has decreed, and for his favors to his people, and for its restoration to grace after its fall. Let us adore this person endowed with the human and the divine nature. Let us reverence it and accept it as our head. Let us confess that he is worthy of all glory, praise, and magnificence. And as the author of grace, let us give him glory and acknowledge his power and divinity. With such arms, St. Michael and his angels gave battle, fighting, as it were, with the powerful rays of the truth against the dragon and his followers, who on their hand made use of blasphemies. But Lucifer, at the sight of the holy prince, not being able to resist, was torn with interior rage and sought to fly from his torments. It was the will of God, however, that he should not only be punished, but also conquered, in order that by his fall he might know the truth and power of God. Nevertheless, he blasphemed and cried out, Unjust is God in the raising the human nature above the angelic. I am the most exalted and beautiful angel, and the triumph belongs to me. It is I who am to place my throne above the stars, and who shall be like unto the highest. I will subject myself to no one of an inferior nature, and I will not consent that anyone take precedence of me or be greater than I. In the same way spoke the apostate followers of Lucifer, but St. Michael answered, Who is there like unto the Lord who dwells in the heavens, or who to compare himself with him? Be silent, enemy, cease thy dreadful blasphemies, and since iniquity has taken possession of thee, depart from our midst, wretch, and be hurled in thy blind ignorance and wickedness into the dark night and chaos of the infernal pains. But let us, O spirits of the Lord, honor and reverence this blessed woman, who is to give human flesh to the eternal word, and let us recognize her as our queen and lady. The great sign of the woman served the good angels as a shield and as arms of battle against the evil ones. For at the sight of it, all their power of reasoning weakened and was brought to confusion and silence, 
since they could not endure the mysteries and sacraments contained in this sign. And just as by divine power this mysterious sign appeared, so also now the other figure or sign of the dragon appeared, in order that thus transformed he might be ignominiously hurled from heaven amid the fright and terror of his followers and amid the astonishment of the holy angels. All this was the, was the effect of this new manifestation of the justice and power of God. It is difficult to describe in words what passed in the, that memorable battle, since there is such a wide difference between our conceptions founded on material objects and those which would be appropriate to the nature and operations of such great spirits as the angels. But the bad ones did not prevail, for injustice, lies, ignorance, and malice could not prevail against equity, truth, light, and goodness. <clears throat> nor could these virtues be overcome by vices therefore it is also said from that time on their place was not found in heaven through the sins which were which these disgraced angels had committed they made themselves unworthy of the eternal vision and, and company of the lord their memory was blotted out from his mind where they had been written by the excellences of, and graces of the nature given to them Having lost the right to the places which had been reserved for them, if they had obeyed, it passed over to mankind. To man these places were now transferred in such a way that the very vestiges of the apostate angels were blotted out and were no more found in heaven. Oh, unhappy wickedness and never to be described misfortune which drew after itself such a horrible and dreadful chastisement, the evangelist adds, and the dragon was cast out, that ancient, ser ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, who seduceth the, seduceth the whole world. And he was cast unto the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. The holy Prince Michael hurled from heaven that dragon Lucifer with the invincible battle cry, Who is like unto God? So powerful was this cry that it sufficed to precipitate that proud giant and all his hosts to the earth and cast him in dreadful ignominy to the center of the earth. From that time he began to be called dragon, serpent, devil, and Satan, imposed upon him by the holy archangel in that battle as a testimony of his iniquity and malice. Deprived of the happiness and honor of which he had become unworthy, he was despoiled also of his names and honorable titles, acquiring in their stead such as designate his ignominy. The wicked plans which he proposed and enjoined upon his confederates, namely, that they should deceive and pervert all those that live in the world, manifest sufficiently his wickedness. He, therefore, who intended to scourge the nations, was consigned to hellish regions, as Isaiah said in the 14th chapter, to the profound abyss, and his cadaver was delivered to the moth and to the worm of his own bad conscience. Thus was fulfilled in Lucifer all that the prophet says in that chapter. When the heavens had been cleared of the bad angels, and the divinity had been unveiled to the good and the obedient, when they had already admitted into glory, when they were already admitted into glory, and the bad ones chastened, chast, chastened, then happened what the evangelist farther says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our Lord and the power of his Christ, because the accuser of our, of our brethren is cast forth who accused them before our God day and night. This voice which the evangelist heard was that of the word, and, uh, and all the holy angels heard and listened to it. Its echoes reverberated through the infernal regions and filled with trembling and fear the demons. They did not, however, understand its mystery in full, but only so much of it as the Most High chose to manifest to them for their greater affliction and punishment. It was the voice of the Son, who in the name of the humanity which he was to assume, was asking the Eternal Father that the salvation, power, and kingdom of his majesty and the reign of Christ might begin, since the accuser of the brethren of the same Christ our Lord, that is, of man, had been cast out. It was like a petition before the throne of the Most Holy Trinity, that the salvation and power and the mysteries of the redemption and incarnation be put into execution. He asked that it be done so much the sooner as Lucifer, 
being filled with fury, envy, and wrath against the human nature, which the word was to assume, was now infesting the earth. Full of love and compassion, the word calls men his brethren. Lucifer is said to accuse them day and night, because both during the day in which he still enjoyed divine grace, in the presence of the Eternal Father and of the Holy Trinity, he belittled us in his pride, and much more, in the night of his own darkness and of our fall, he pursues us unceasingly with slander and persecution, as long as this world will endure. The word calls the works and mysteries of the Incarnation and His death, virtue, power, and reign, because in them all these really had their beginning, and in them was manifested His great virtue and power against Lucifer. This was the first time in which the Word in the name of His humanity interceded for men before the divinity, and in which, according to our mode of conceiving such things, the Eternal Father conferred with the other persons of the Blessed Trinity in regard to this petition. He also partly revealed to the holy angels the decree of his divine consistory, saying in regard to the sacraments resolved upon, Lucifer has raised the banner of pride and sin and will persecute with all his malice the whole human race. With cunning he will pervert many men, availing himself of their own passions for their destruction. In the blindness of sin and vice men will prevaricate heedless of danger. But his lying pride, his sins and vices are infinitely distant from our nature and wishes. We will therefore bring out the triumph of virtue and sanctity. For this purpose, the second person will assume human nature. He will exalt and teach humanity, obedience and all the virtues, and thus will secure the salvation of mortals. Being true God, he will become humble and submissive. He will be the just man, the model and teacher of all virtues. These alone shall be accredited before our tribunal and shall always triumph over vices we will rise up the lowly and humble the proud matthew 11:28 we will make labors and endurance praiseworthy in our sight we resolve to help the afflicted and the sorrowful let them be corrected by afflictions and thereby advance in our grace and friendship and according to their capabilities reach salvation in the practice of virtue blessed will be they that weep matthew 5:3 and happy the poor, and those that suffer for justice sake, and for Christ, their chief, and the in insignificant ones shall be magnified, the meek of heart exalted, the peaceful shall be loved as our sons, most dear shall be those most dear shall those be to us who forgive and suffer injuries and love their enemies. We will assign to them copious benedictions of our grace and an immortal glory in heaven. Our only begotten will put in practice these decrees, and those that follow him shall be our chosen ones, our cherished ones. They shall be refreshed and rewarded by us. Their good works shall be engendered in our own mind, which is the first cause of all virtue. We give permission to the bad ones to oppress the good, thus helping them to gain the crown, while for themselves they increase the punishment. Let there be scandals, Matthew 18:7, for the common good. Unhappy be those that cause them, and bless they that are proved by them. The vain and the proud will afflict and despise the humble. The great and the powerful will oppress the lowly and abject ones. They will give benediction instead of curses. 1 Corinthians 4.12 While they are pilgrims, they shall be rejected by men, but afterwards they shall be ranked with the angelic spirits, our sons, and they will enjoy the seats and crowns which the unfortunate and unhappy apostates have lost. The stubborn and the proud shall be condemned to eternal death, where they will recognize their foolish proceedings and their perverseness. In order that all may have a true model and superabundant grace, if they wish to use it, the Son will descend, capable of suffering and as a Redeemer, and he shall save men, whom Lucifer defrauded of their happy state, and he shall raise them up through his infinite merits. We have resolved and determined upon the salvation of men through a Redeemer and Teacher, who shall be able to propitiate the, and to teach, who shall be born and live poor, shall die despised, condemned by men to a most ignominious and frightful death, who shall be esteemed a sinner and a criminal, and yet shall satisfy our justice for the guilt of sin. On account of his foreseen merits, we will show mercy and kindness. All will understand, and those who are humble and peaceful, those that practice virtue, that suffer and yet forgive, are the followers of Christ and our sons. Nobody will be capable of entering by his own free will into our kingdom unless he denies himself and, taking up his cross, follows his chief and master. 
Matthew 10, 22. Our kingdom shall be composed of the perfect who have legitimately labored and fought, persevering to the end. These will take part in the reign of our Christ, now begun and determined upon, for the accuser of his brethren has been cast down. The triumph of Christ is secured. To him belong exaltations and glory, since he is to wash and purify men with his blood. Therefore only he shall be worthy to open the book of the law of grace. Apocalypse 5, nine. He is the way, the light, the truth, and the life. I don't know what that one is. He is the way, the light, the truth, and the life. Through which men may come to me. He alone shall open the gates of heaven. He shall be the mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5 And the advocate of mortals. In him they will have a father, a brother, and protector after having been freed from the accuser and persecutor. persecutor. And the angels who like true sons have shared in the work of our salvation and power and have defended the reign of my Christ shall likewise be honored and crowned through all the eternities of eternities in my presence. This voice which contains the mysteries hidden since the constitution of the world and manifested by the doctrine and the life of Jesus Christ issued forth from the throne and imported more than I can explain. Through it were assigned the commissions which the holy angels were to fulfill. Saint Michael and Saint Gabriel were appointed ambassadors of the incarnate word and of Mary, his mother, most holy. They were to be ministers for all the mysteries of the incarnation and redemption. With these two princes, many other angels were assigned to the same service, as I shall explain afterward. Other angels the Almighty appointed as companions and guardians of the souls to teach them and inspire them with the virtues and sanctity opposed to the vices into which Lucifer had proposed to seduce mankind. They were to guard and defend the souls and to carry them in their hands, Psalms 90, 12, in order that the just might not hurt their feet against the stones, which are the snares and the traps laid by their enemies. Also other things were decreed on this occasion, of which the evangelist says that the power, salvation, virtue, and kingdom of Christ began. But among the mysterious works at this time was especially the designation and enumeration of the predestined and the secret tablets of the divine mind through the foreseen merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, the mysteries and the inexplicable secrets which then were evolved in the bosom of God. Oh, happy lot of the chosen ones! What can equal this importance? What sacrament is so worthy of the omnipotence of God? How great was the triumph of the power of Christ! How infinitely happy the members who then were assigned and united to such a head! O oh, great church! O oh, mighty people and holy congregation of such a leader and master! At the thought of such exalted mysteries, the judgment of the creature is rendered powerless. My understanding is suspended and my tongue becomes mute. In the consistory of the three divine persons, the mysterious book spoke of it of in the Apocalypse was given, and as it were, delivered to the only begotten of the Father. At that time it was written, closed and sealed with the seven seals, Apocalypse 5, 7, of which the evangelist speaks. When he was made human flesh, he opened it, solving in their order the seals by enacting the mysteries of his birth, life, and death into the con unto the consummation of all things. That which the book contained were all the decrees of the Holy Trinity after the fall of the angels, namely, all that belongs to the incarnation of the Word, and the law of grace, the Ten Commandments, the seven sacraments, and all the articles of faith, and what is contained in them, the constitution of the whole militant church, to the Word as having assumed human nature, and as the high priest and holy pontiff, Hebrews 6.20, was given the power to communicate the necessary faculties and gifts of the apostles, and the other priests and ministers of the church. This was the mysterious beginning of the law of the gospel. In a most secret consist consistory, cons consist consistory of the Trinity, it was resolved and recorded in the divine mind that those who would observe that law shall be written in the book of life. 
Here was the beginning of that law, and from the Eternal Father, the pontiffs and prelates had their power and their vicariate. From his infinite power flows the virtues of those that are meek, poor in spirit, humble and just. This is their most humble origin, and on that account it is true to say that he who obeys the superior obeys God. Luke, Luke 10, 16, L-U-C 10, 16. And he who despises them despises God. All this was decreed and conceived in the divine mind, and to Christ was given the power to open in its proper time this book of decrees, which was until then to be closed and sealed. In the meanwhile, the Most High gave his testament, that it's that is the testimonies of his divine words in the natural laws and in the written laws, accompanying them with wonderful works and manifesting a part of his secrets through the patriarchs and prophets. Through these testimonies and through the blood of the Lamb, it is said, they, the just, overcame him, the dragon. For although the blood of Christ was entirely sufficient and superabundant to enable all the faithful to overcome the dragon, their accuser, and although the testimonies and teachings of the prophets are of great power and help for eternal salvation, yet the just attain the fruit of the passion and redemption by cooperating of their own free will with these divine helps, conquering their own selves and the demons and making use of grace. They not only succeed in fulfilling the ordinary commandments and counsels of God, but they go to the extent of sacrificing their lives for the Lord. Apocalypse 6.9 in testimony of him and in the hope of the crown and triumph promised by Christ as the martyrs did, in testimony of the faith and in defending his honor. On account of all these mysteries, the sacred text adds, Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and all those that dwell therein. Rejoice, because thou art to be the dwelling place of the just and their, of their chief, Jesus Christ, and of his most holy mother. Rejoice, O heaven, because all of all the material and inanimate creatures, none obtained a better lot. For thou art to be the house of God, who will endure through the eternal ages, and thou art to receive as thy queen the most pure and most holy creature that emanated from the power of the Most High. Therefore rejoice, heaven, and all that dwell therein, ye angels and ye just, since you are to be the companions and ministers of the Son of the Eternal Father and of his mother, and you are to be the parts of that mystical body whose head is Christ himself. Rejoice, ye holy angels, because ministering to them and serving them by your defense and custody, you increase your accidental joy. Let the holy archangel Michael, the prince of the celestial hosts, rejoice in particular because he defended in battle the glory of the Most High and his adorable mysteries, and because he is to be the minister of the incarnation of the word and a particular witness of, it, of all its effect to the end. Let all his allies and all the defenders of Jesus Christ and his mother rejoice, since during their ministry they do not lose the joys of essential glory already their own. On account of such divine sacraments, let the heavens rejoice. Amen.